It's Monday. It's January 29th. And the word of the day is finifugal, which means avoiding the end of something, like an excellent book, because you want it to go on forever. Used in a sentence, I've been saying literary edging, and I'm glad I found the classy adjective version of that, finifugal. See, see, Lucida, I'm not moving on to another game without finishing the last one. I'm finifugaling that one. <laughs> Exactly. Indefinitely. Yeah. Whereas I prolong books just so I then don't have to go out and spend money on the next book because I'm uh, do finifrugal. <laughs> <laughs> no illusion. I'm Michael Marshall. I'm Heath Enright and broadcasting delayed from America's Far Center and across the pond. We are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, the British Post Office will try to argue that justice just got lost in the mail. Donald Trump asks E. Jean Carroll how much she'll knock off if he lets her be his running mate. And Colorado rolls out the red carpet bag for Lauren Boebert. But first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow skeptic rats, No Illusions, and Michael Marshall, gentlemen. Big year coming up. So from 1 to 10, how good is 2024 going to be by the time it's over? Hmm. You know what? I'm going to be optimistic and say two. We're up, we're due for an upswing, right? <laughs> okay. Whereas I'm going to say ten, but only because once it's over, we'll be retrospectively comparing it to how 2025 is somehow even worse, and it will go. feel like a ten by comparison. Positive spin. Thank you. <laughs> In our lead story tonight, Donald Trump found out again. Uh, this time to the tune of $83.3 million. The spake the Manhattan jury on Friday that was tasked with deciding how much he owed to journalist E. Jean Carroll for defamation. And of course, because it's Trump, it's the evilest possible form of defamation. He dismissed her accusations that he raped her as a hoax and called her mentally sick for making them. Okay, she sounds a lot more like a stable genius to me right? if I had to like describe it. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is actually the second time he's been found guilty of defaming Carol over this. Uh, in her memoir, she accused Trump of raping her in a Bergdorf Goodman dressing room in the mid-90s, forcing his fingers into her vagina or, in a more vulgar parlance, grabbing her by the pussy, which would seem eminently plausible even if he hadn't admitted to doing that kind of shit on a hot mic. And the first jury already agreed that he did, in fact, rape her, and the judge in this one, one Lewis Kaplan, decided that the jury's ruling from that case would also apply to this one. So all this new jury had to decide was how much Trump owed. Carol was asking for $10 million, and the jury was like, no, we raise. We Can, or can we raise? <laughs> um, can. That, uh, ultimately, they braced down to $11 million for reputational damage, $7.3 million for emotional harm, and $65 million in punitive damages. Now, unsurprisingly, Carol was elated on the way out of the court. The now 80-year-old journalist called the jury's decision a, quote, great victory for every woman who stands up when she's been knocked down and a huge defeat for every bully who has tried to keep a woman down, end quote. Uh, Trump called the decision, you know, I don't know. Is it something in all fucking caps with exclamation marks? I'm sure. It's probably something defamatory given his record. Oh, yeah, there is there is no way that he isn't going to defame her again over this. And now we know she can definitely afford to hire lawyers to sue him again. Right. So, like, the ideal scenario is he loses a new defamation case to her, like, every year for the rest of his life, like some kind of wildly <laughs> expensive <laughs> annual subscription service. That'd be the right, best. Right, yeah, he's like, I keep meaning to cancel the defamation. <laughs> you know about this thing called Rocket Money? <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, and also, uh, by the way, he apparently he stormed out of the courtroom during Carol's attorney's closing arguments. Uh, though he did slink back in uh, in time for his side's wrap up, and and he did also testify in the case, but it only lasted for four minutes because the judge wouldn't let him argue against shit that had already been decided in the previous that trial. That was done. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He tried to give a big rant several times, but in response to a yes no question. So the judge was like, "Okay, well you're done. Eighty three million gavel." Great. Yeah, right. Yeah. The judge did him such a favor there because there is no way he wouldn't have used that testimony to defame her again in like <laughs> right. new and like even more expensive <laughs> ways. And it could have been the first case in history where the closing arguments actually doubled as the opening statements for the next case and we just yeah, rolled right. on so through. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, unfortunately, she won't see any of the money anytime soon, uh, but Trump will probably still have to part with it regardless. Uh, he's vowed to appeal the decision, as he did with a smaller $5.5 million judgment in a previous defamation suit, uh, and the appeal will probably take years to play out. But in that earlier instance, he did have to pay the court the $5.5 million during the appeal process which like the court would then turn over to Carroll if and when he runs out of appellate courts. And he'll probably have to do the same here. As I understand it, he could present the court with a bond that might allow him to use property as collateral without having to actually liquidate anything, which I, I believe he would have to do to come up with $83 million. But that would require finding a bank that would be willing to lend him tens of millions of dollars. And I feel like that's slim pickings right now when it comes to banks, right? Especially since we're about to see a way bigger ju a judgment that will dwarf this one uh, in the in New York civil case against the Trump organization. And, of course, he's facing 91 felony counts in four separate criminal indictments. Right, yeah. And, and the thing is, you can't put property down as collateral when every piece of property you own is already the subject of a different legal case. Right, Makes yeah. That tricky. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much the only thing that Trump still has that could uncomplicatedly be used as collateral is probably Don Jr. Like, that guy's at least 80% cocaine these days. There's got to be a, a lot of value tied up in him. Oh, yeah, no, if you boil him up, right, and skim <laughs> off the top, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's pretty close to uncut, yeah. And <laughs> here's the thing, if you happen to have any piece of shit apologists for Trump in your life, many of us do, you might have heard the argument that the ruling was only about the defamation and it didn't confirm the sexual assault. Except, yes, the fuck it did. Yep. And the judge put out a dedicated statement to make those terrible people shut the fuck up. Given the contents of the charges, it would be logically impossible for the jury not to be confirming the assault itself on top of the defamation. That's exactly. what the judge explained. Exactly. And speaking of dedicated statements from the judge, I have one last chilling detail I want to add to this one, lest we close things on an upbeat. Upon dismissing the jury, Judge Kaplan informed them that they're now allowed to speak publicly about the case, but he advised them against doing so. He said, quote, my advice to you is that you never disclose that you are on this jury and I won't say anything more about it, end quote. Yikes. So, wow. Yeah, just a quick reminder of the kind of person we're on the verge of renominating for the presidency. Ugh. And speaking of how we're all going to die, let's take a quick break for a word from this week's sponsor, Trust and Will. All right, two of the Haynes 97 and four of the Haynes 95. I got four. Hey, he's nice. You, you playing with your collection of old fabric with holes what no no these are my vintage boxer briefs extremely rare super valuable i'm cataloging my estate noah your estate yes yes my estate i'm engaged now and i'm organizing my legacy mm. i want to make an estate plan to give peace of mind and security to ann and kai of course i don't think you're doing it right but if you or someone with actual assets wants to make an estate plan why don't you just try trust and will Oh, what's Trust and Will? With Trust and Will, you can create and manage a custom estate plan starting at just $159. And I'm told they do a great job. I heard from a really good friend who used Trust and Will to plan her estate, and she said the process was a breeze with a website that's simple and straightforward. Huh. Did you and uh, Lucinda get the cats We that? We did. Get the cats, yes. Nice. And, and Trust and Will made it easy. Each will or trust is state-specific and customized to your needs. That includes care wishes, nomination guardians, power of attorney, and even cats. Their simple step-by-step -step process guides you from start to finish with ease, and it saves your loved ones the time and stress by having all the right documents in one place with bank-level encryption. They even have live customer support through phone, chat, and email. All right, sounds good. But how's their reputation? That's a great question. Trust and Will has an overall rating of excellent and thousands of five-star reviews on Trustpilot. All right. I'm sold. Where do I sign up? Secure your assets and protect your loved ones with Trust and Will. Get 10% off plus free shipping on your estate plan documents by visiting trustandwill.com slash skeptocrat. That's 10% off and free shipping at trustandwill.com slash skeptocrat? Exactly. But just to be clear, when you said, where do I sign up, you meant Anne. Who has a real job, and right? And who has a real job, yes. Got it, got it. Mm. So were you going to were you gonna do a thing here now? What, what thing? What are, you, what are you talking about? Well, it feels like you would have some sort of weird behavior with your Haynes collection. 
the end? Oh uh, no, uh, just gonna keep wearing them. They, they don't really fit into a button here at the end. It was just oh. for the beginning. Sure, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel, I feel like Eli would have had a button. At the wow, end. wow. Okay, you, you know what? There, I killed my boxers. End of sketch. Okay, button. that doesn't that doesn't even make sense. Okay. You did the okay backwards. Okay. You say it. <laughs> okay? Okay. And we're back. And next up in headlines in Not All Who Rwanda Are Lost News. <laughs> <laughs> Here in the UK, our hugely unpopular right-wing government are, in a desperate bid for relevance and support, trying to convince us that the biggest issue in the country right now is a massive influx of illegal migrants across our southern border. Now, I know that's a situation that American listeners are going to find kind of hard to relate to, but stick with me here. (laughs) Stick with me. So all a diversion by Canada and Scotland to sneak into our wonderful countries from the north, right? (laughs) God, if this isn't a story about Dover trying to fill the English Channel with razor wire, you got nothing on us, Marsh, okay? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> okay, so three prime ministers ago, or um, 18 months as it is. So recently. <laughs> <laughs> Boris Johnson announced a plan to deal with refugees crossing the channel in small boats. Uh, And the whole plan was the brainchild of the Home Secretary at the time, Suella Braverman, who hired this big ship off the coast of Dorset and wanted to put all the refugees in there in like a floating migrant prison. Um, but they shelved so that scheme. So evil. Yeah, what it is. fuck? But they shelved that scheme when, and this is not a joke, their prison ship was found to be infested with Legionnaire's disease. Oh, Jesus. So the plan of Suella was foiled by Legionella. And <laughs> this isn't what people usually mean when they say that history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. <laughs> okay. I feel like she got excited by, like, Suella DeVille as a name and wanted oh, to roll yeah. with it, had some momentum. <laughs> I mean, you wrote that joke, Heath, but her political nickname is literally genuinely Cruella Braverman. It genuinely oh, is. Her Seriously? name isn't even Suella. Her name is Suella, and she chose Suella. I assume because really? wow. it rhymes with Cruella. I assume that's the only reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, sure, because she looked at Australia and she was like, well, you know, the problem with uninhabitable islands is that they never sink. That's yeah, where exactly. we're going wrong here. <laughs> so one plague ship down, the government turned to plan B, and that was to put the refugees on a plane and fly them to Rwanda, where their asylum application could therefore be processed. Um, and just be absolutely clear, that's not their application for asylum to the UK. They'd have to be applying for asylum in Rwanda, not here. Uh, and that's a fact that even Tory MPs apparently missed at the time and had to be reminded of on air when they brought this up. And this isn't so much a deal with the UK's refugee crisis plan as it is a create a refugee crisis in Rwanda plan. Wow. Right. Okay, apparently the Tories were talking to DeSantis and Greg Abbott and they were like, all right, hold my tepid beer. I'll one up <laughs> But Boris Johnson quit and then Liz Truss trust she came and went uh and suella bravman was sacked as home secretary and reappointed literally a week later and then sacked again a year later from the same position and sunak was then left in charge of a plan that wasn't just stupid but completely and obviously illegal and the uk supreme court actually agreed on that and ruled it unlawful because of rwanda's human rights record and the very real risk that they just send refugees back to their home country to be tortured Which, despite what several Tory MPs might think, that's a bug and not a feature of the scheme. Yeah, no, I retract my joke from before. I feel like there's got to be some humanitarian redneck in Texas right now going, Jesus, just fill the English Channel with razor wire, you cruel bastards. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, the spectacle of watching Tories try to defend this obviously stupid idea has been genuinely incredible to behold. Um, When quizzed by the BBC about it, the Tory MP Rachel McLean said on air live, quote, Rwanda has always been a safe country. Really? Which is an amazing statement, because if you found the average person on the street and asked them what comes to mind when you hear the words Rwanda, Uh they will answer in order Rwandan genocide, Rwandan civil war and the film Hotel Rwanda. That is not an ideal list for your immigration plan. And spoiler alert, that film, it's not about Don Cheadle trying to deal with a bad Yelp review. No, there's there's more than that. All I'm saying is if you've seen Hotel Rwanda, it's pretty clear what happened there and who to blame. Who who to who to blame? Look, someone's oh. got to bring the genocide puns. Someone's got to do it. Excellent wordplay, Marsh. 
Tootsie rolling in the aisles. Tootsie <laughs> rolling in the I'm just trying to help. And also, not for nothing, but since 2022, at least six Rwandan citizens have themselves been granted asylum in the UK from Rwanda. Oh, wow. So the, the place that we're sending asylum seekers to is so unsafe that we accept asylum seekers from there. <laughs> and maybe that's the plan all along. I don't know. Like Maybe the idea is we send asylum seekers to Rwanda... They settle in Rwanda. Eventually, they get Rwandan citizenship, at which point they're allowed to apply for asylum in the UK as Rwandans. <laughs> Helping them out with, like, extracurriculars on their application. Exactly. Right. It's, it's like, it's it's like leveling up, right, as a refugee. And, hey, the way British politics are going, who knows what country they'll be in when they finish leveling up, right? <laughs> yeah. And so to solve this legal impasse with the Supreme Court, Sunak came up with a brilliant plan. He mm. introduced a bill that just declared Rwanda to be a safe country and that the UK courts therefore had to ignore anybody who said otherwise, including (laughs) the Supreme Court, the Human Rights Act and the International Refugee Convention. Like, Sunak's plan is genuinely to put forward a because I say so law uh, with an (laughs) actually I hear Kigali's pretty lovely this time of year (laughs) subclause just so he can pander to the racists in his party. It's amazing. Wow. I actually enjoyed the response from Labour Party leader Keir Starmer. He called the Tories who supported this quote, hundreds of bald men scrapping over a single broken comb. (laughs) Damn it. The British are even better at dysfunctional government than us. I am so jealous, Marsh. Right, because the thing is, this law that Sunak has proposed, it breaks international law. So the chambers of the UK Parliament are now trying to figure out what the fuck to do with that. You know, you've got lots of MPs who voted against it because it's obviously inhumane and legal, but there's also a handful of Tory MPs who voted against it because it's not inhumane enough. They wanted it to go further and be worse. And the leader of that latter category of rebel Tories is Suala Braverman, the person who came up with this scheme in the first place. (laughs) Hey, can we get like a slow lowering device in the thing before we finish it? I don't like a crotch, whereas Yeah, too few sharks is my criticism. Exactly, exactly. I'm going to need a lectern where I can do my monologue. What are we going to Brexit out of to negate an international law here? (laughs) Well, you joke, Noah, but the answer to that question is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I only know that because the government is genuinely talking about opting out of it so that this can be allowed. Genuinely. Um, and the one thing we haven't talked about in all what of this. What is happening? It's like you're trying to name the most evil possible thing to do, and you're yeah. doing it? Yeah, that is basically the Tory manifesto. That's the Tory electoral promise going yeah. into 2024, 2025 election. Yeah. Um, and the one thing we haven't talked about all of this is the cost, because the, Rwanda aren't accepting these people for free. Um, so far, the UK has paid Rwanda £240 million to take all these refugees. And so far, all of the refugees, that number so far that we've flown to Rwanda is nil. Like, not a single what? one. Which which is a good thing, because this plan is obscene yeah, right. and inhumane. <laughs> sure. But it does mean that Rwanda have managed to negotiate being paid a quarter of a billion pounds to do nothing at all. Wow. <laughs> kind of like Gareth Southgate, am I right? Right, Marsh? Hey, right? He showed us what healthy masculinity looks like, and he is worth every penny. I will not hear a bad word said against him. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Anyway, to cap all of this off, football joke. The, the actual number of refugees that we're talking about who would be eligible under this Rwanda scheme is, according to the scheme, a maximum of 200 people. That's what we're talking about here, 200 Jesus. refugees. Rwanda have been paid £240 million to deal with 200 people, or rather, to not even deal with 200 people. And the thing is, if Rishi Sunak had just set up a massive, like, welcome to the UK booth at the port of Dover, where he handed every (laughs) single one of those people a million pounds on arrival, (laughs) that would have been fiscally responsible by comparison, unless he'd hired, like, a really fucking expensive booth. (laughs) And next up in headlines, in sub-optimist primary news, the people have spoken... And Donald Trump is almost certainly going to be the GOP nominee for president of the United States again. And by the people, I mean the savvy political scientists that are Republicans from Iowa and New Hampshire. They held their caucuses and their primary, and they looked at the best of the best from their party, and they landed on the guy from The Apprentice with an acne breakout on his tiny little baby hands, or whatever the fuck that was on his hands. So... Pending the results from four different criminal cases against him. No, you said it was 91 charges. Yeah, 90, 91 wow. Yeah. yeah, or not. I guess maybe he runs from jail. Pending that, 
we're going to see a rematch between Donald Trump and Joe Biden in November. That's where we are with American democracy right now. You you start electing TV hosts, you get reruns, people. This was bound to happen. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you say that, but like Biden's 81 and Trump is like a really bad 77. I think a nasty cold has more chance of preventing this rematch than any of those criminal cases have. Mm. Is it is it illegal to encourage infectious disease carriers to attend Trump rallies? I forget how <laughs> your First Amendment works and Eli's taken the whiteboard with him, so I right, can't check. Right, right, yeah. Dangerous <laughs> precedent. Tricky. So the big wins for Trump in Iowa and New Hampshire quickly led to dropouts from nearly the entire Republican field other than Nikki Haley. And those dropouts were immediately followed by a fiercely contested bootlicking tournament with all the former candidates doing performative flip-flops that led to some severe physical injuries as they pretended to like Donald Trump the whole time. In fairness, some normal amount of that would be just good strategy by the party. You know, you, you fight hard in the primary, but then you close ranks and rally around the presumptive winner. The Republican National Committee actually made that official and had the candidates make a pledge to support the eventual nominee. But the only major holdout on that pledge was Donald Trump. And yet he's still getting endorsed by the dropouts. It makes no sense. Well, to be fair, getting endorsed by dropouts is basically his whole thing. (laughs) Okay, well, that's part of strategy. So here's a few of the red waffle highlights. I'll start with Ron DeSantis, who was apparently very confident in his chances And then he had to squeeze out a harumphy flip-flop last week, like a kid who had to apologize for stealing a crayon. He went from an all-out attack on Trump over the last year and wafted himself over to an endorsement saying very begrudgingly, while we've had disagreements, Trump is superior to Joe Biden. I signed a pledge to support the Republican nominee and I'll honor that pledge, God. (laughs) (laughs) Right, no. All the best endorsements come with a reference to how contractually obligated they are. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the thing is, Trump like called DeSantis a pedophile. And then DeSantis's like official position on that now is, well, you know, agree to disagree. What can I yes, say? Live right, right. right. Yeah. We also got a similar teeth gnashing endorsement from Vivek Ramaswamy, along with many other prominent Republicans who were outspoken critics of Trump, but they weren't part of the primary. Marco Rubio went from Trump is a con artist to yeah, but still, I guess I'll vote for him. But I, I said yep. he was an artist. That's a compliment. He's an artist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we also heard from Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz went from Trump is a sniveling coward and a pathological liar to exact words. I look forward to supporting him enthusiastically. Not adding. Also, I'm starting a civil war out of Texas because we demand razor wire to maim immigrants at the border. That's yeah. the thing now. Right. No, there can Terrifying. never be true justice in a world where Ted Cruz isn't inadvertently strangled by razor wire on his way to Cancun. <laughs> ah, so adding inadvertently is how your First Amendment thing works. Right. Got That's it. one Understand of the way. Right. Right. Not in. You have to be allowed to, to hope for things, any- Mark. That's, we're not involved. We're That's the American like, way. Pursuit That's of American happiness. Dream. God damn it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But for me, the craziest flip-flop was Tim Scott. So immediately after ending his campaign last week, he stood directly behind Trump during a press conference in support. And during Trump's little speech, he said, Tim, you must really hate Nikki Haley. And that's when Tim Scott stepped up to the mic and said exact words, I just love you. Oh, and there's a great moment when Scott like steps up to the mic, Trump turns and says like, uh-oh, just instinctively. But to be fair, he just says that any time he turns around and there's a black person just existing. That's just his natural reaction. <laughs> yes, right. just a knee-jerk reaction for him. Uh, also, side note, complete tangent here, but I learned this recently. Nikki Haley, yeah, she might be less evil than Donald Trump, but she's also terrible. And not just for being a Republican, although that's a lot of it. She also changed the name of her husband on a whim first name (laughs) soon after meeting him she said you know what you don't look like a bill i'm gonna call you michael from now on good choice apparently (laughs) ever since that moment everyone who's met bill haley calls him michael haley amazing also she doesn't think the civil war was about slavery it's both of those things make her bad Heath chose to lead <laughs> right. with the name thing I also I might have made a different decision well Heath just really hates it when people go by something other than their real names he's got a real well, bugbear about that <laughs> yeah. so obviously a big motivator behind all the flip-flopping is a desire to get picked as a running mate 
because VP is a big stepping stone for a political career of almost getting hanged and than being unemployed forever. <laughs> right. <laughs> among the front runners for that very plum job are people like Ramaswamy, DeSantis, and Tim Scott. According to the Washington Post, that list also includes Arkansas Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders. And the only thing holding her back is a scandal from late last year that we actually never got a chance to talk about. So I want to talk about it for a second. That scandal is called Podium Gate. Apparently, Sarah Huckabee spent $19,000 on something called a Falcon-style lectern that got paid for with a government credit card. And thanks to some great work on FOIA requests by blogger Matthew Campbell, we learned about this absurd expenditure. And the moment the Arkansas governor's office found out about the FOIA requests, they started trying to cover the whole thing up. And they got caught doing that Thanks to more FOIA requests and also a whistleblower. <laughs> and here's the response from Sarah Huckabee Sanders about this. When asked about the $19,000 lectern, she said it has, quote, a number of features. <laughs> Height, for example. <laughs> also also uh, depth. It has yeah, uh, it ha width. It has <laughs> time. It's in time. time. It is in time. Yeah. <laughs> How did she expect to get away with paying $19,000 for a seriously ugly lectern? Because a lectern is only something that you won't even use when you're stood in front of a crowd or at a press conference. Right. Like, yes. Surely at the first <laughs> press conference where she uses it, question one was always going to be, yeah, what's up with a fucking hideous lectern? That was always hey, going to be question first one. First question, what the fuck is that? Yeah, that's yeah. a very reasonable first question. <laughs> Although I don't doubt that she has a spot in her weird house that has like a lectern set up just for like private. <laughs> <laughs> practicing all you know no, all the fair. features yeah. getting used to oh, the yeah, features of the lectern <laughs> nonsense also just in case anyone's curious the latest polls for a general election with trump as the gop nominee are showing trump ahead of biden by a margin of about five to seven percentage points so fucking d up yeah. and vote and vote correctly god <sighs> yikes and in one helo a gal news we have a tearful obituary to share with you this week, as we learned last Thursday that NASA's Ingenuity helicopter, known as Ginny to her friends, will fly the hazy copper skies of Mars no more. Do you want me to sing Dust in the Wind? Or if something? you would, yeah. I feel actually, like, okay. Yeah. So, yes, <laughs> NASA confirmed last week that in its 72nd flight, it experienced what they're calling a, quote, unplanned early landing, end quote. Okay. An event that less sophisticated tongues might shorten to <laughs> crash. Anomalous verticality fluctuation is what <laughs> happened. But during this anomalous verticality fluctuation, at least one of the helicopter's blades was damaged. Or unexpectedly suboptimally reconfigured, yeah. As they say, yes. <laughs> Crippling it and ending its historic reign as the first object to achieve heavier-than-air flight on an alien world. It is survived by its parent rover, the Perseverance. And I'm sure the parent rover is very sad about it, but somehow they'll find a way to continue. Yes, exactly. <laughs> They're known for that. Now, when you look at its end of career stats, they don't seem particularly impressive. Ingenuity took her inaugural flight on April 19th of 2021, which reached an altitude of about three meters and traveled a distance of nothing. Zero, <laughs> which is like went up and then came back down. <laughs> Over its nearly three-year lifespan, it would fly a grand total of 72 missions for a total of 358 <laughs> meters, or Sorry. about 1,200 feet. <laughs> they use the word missions? I think they do. I, fucking maybe relax. that's just me. I don't know. That could okay. have just been me. Um, <laughs> its altitude topped out at about 12 meters, or 40 feet, and its longest single flight was about two minutes and five seconds. So basically, Kitty Hawk numbers from the Wright brothers, essentially. Um, that being said- Impressive. Given that Mars has approximately 1% the atmosphere of Earth, the fact that JPL's engineers managed to make a helicopter fly for any seconds and any meters is impressive as all hell. Uh, in the classic NASA lowball, the helicopter was originally designed to make five flights over a 31-day period. Right, which is the same flight schedule as Ryanair, funny enough. <laughs> as it turns out. Um, so, but yeah, but ultimately, unlike Ryanair, it exceeded its mission parameters by either 1,440% or 3,261%, depending on if we want to go by flights or days. Wow. The Lou Gehrig of 
going up three meters. <laughs> but on, on Mars, though. Yeah, on going Mars. up three on meters. So, so basically this robot okay. got high enough to make eye contact with Heath, and we're meant to be impressed by yes, that. Yes, exactly, yeah. <laughs> now, of course, as one robotic space explorer dies, another one is born. Because only a few days before we learned of Ingenuity's dire fate, Japan became the fifth country to join the Moon Lander Club with its Smart Lander for Investigating Moon, or SLIM. Guys, just throw in a the. They're free. Nobody charges yes, you right. for the the exactly. in an acronym. Exactly. <laughs> yes, this slapdashedly acronymed lander tested out a new smart landing system that allowed for far greater precision than any previous moon landing. A range of 100 meters compared to previous landing zones of around 10 kilometers Right. So uh, now, despite losing main engine thrust a good 50 meters above the moon's surface, the lander did manage to hit its target within about 55 meters of dead center. Uh, it had a picture perfect landing in every possible way. Nice. Except that it's upside down. OK. Or maybe it's the moon that was upside down. <laughs> <laughs> Thing is, when it landed upside down, I bet it was a particularly rough day at the office for the guy who insisted they called it the smart lander. Right, like, yeah. Like, I told you we should have gone with, like, sublunar investigative module, Hitoshi. You've made us look like idiots. <laughs> <laughs> now, JAXA, the Japanese equivalent of NASA, is confident that they'll still be able to use the lander, um, though the fact that its solar panels are facing the ground kind of undercuts that optimism in my mind. I don't know. Yeah, maybe they could use it as a paperweight right? is what they can yeah, use right. it for. Yeah, right. The sun is things. also upside down. It doesn't even make sense. <laughs> so, now, but we'll, we'll find out for sure soon. But in my mind, perhaps the coolest aspect of this mission isn't the upside down lander so much as the reason that we have pictures of it. See, while Slim was still circling the moon in preparation for lunar insertion, it dropped a mini lander onto the surface to paparazzi it on the way down. The Mini Lander is a two-part system that includes Lev-1, which is described as a hopping robot in the press release, and Lev-2, which is an only slightly less cute-sounding baseball-sized rover. And these two autonomous robots selected images themselves as the lander touched down, providing more than 275 pictures of the landing in progress. Man, so not only did the lander faceplant, but it had an audience at the time? Yes. Like, I assume it's only staying down out of embarrassment, hoping that the levs eventually go away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, but there's there's still plenty of cool little space bots out there to anthropomorphize, uh, but only one of them had wings. So pour one out for the ingenuity tonight. She will be missed. And in post-truth news... I, I know you guys like to think of the UK as like unimaginably twee and that all of our more serious news stories and political scandals are essentially adorable in comparison to the corruption ridden <laughs> arms fair that is American life. OK, well, if you're worried about sounding twee, maybe say gun show instead of arms. <laughs> 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 But, Sounds like a delightful Renaissance gun yeah. area or something. I don't know. We call Is them arms fairs. We do call show? them arms fairs. Okay. But anyway, today I want to tell you about a story that will, well, I mean, absolutely confirm that opinion 100%. Right. Yeah, because in, in the last few weeks, the UK has finally woken up to a scandal that has been brewing for more than two decades. And the evil bad guy in the story is the post office. Mm. Huh. Wait, are people using them to vote for the rival candidate? Because we've actually had that scandal before. <laughs> done that. <laughs> so, yeah, like the place where you buy stamps and send parcels and the thing that you used to pretend to run as a child with your little slidey window and your plastic coins and your pretend checkbook, that place, <laughs> it turns out, is guilty of literally the most widespread miscarriage of justice in modern British history. Okay, sorry, the image of Baby Marsh running a tiny little post office counter with a slidey window and toy money, <laughs> that is in the dictionary next to the word twee, Marsh. That's <laughs> beautiful and adorable and quaint and lovely. It was a very popular toy in the 80s, inexplicably popular toy in the 80s. Nicholas never grown out of it. Nicholas still British wants children aspired to be running a post office counter? There's, there's a lot of stamping to do. There's a lot of kind of scribbling to do. There's money to <laughs> exchange. There's a slide window it's very fun <laughs> anyway here's here's the story 25 years ago uh, the post office branches around the uk went from doing paper bookkeeping to using a new it system created by fujitsu called horizon and like as soon as this system was installed the people who manage those post offices who are called sub postmasters um they noticed that the computer was making loads of errors totaling up their transactions for the day 
And so they called head office to let them know about these errors and were told this isn't happening in any other branch. So the discrepancy is definitely evidence that they themselves were thieving. And so they, these support masters had to pay the missing amount of money in full. In some cases, this was as much as forty or fifty thousand pounds that suddenly they owed the post office. Jesus. Okay, but I feel like the fact that they were calling was evidence they weren't thieving, though, wasn't yeah, it? You think? <laughs> but it turns out the post office, even at the time, were lying, and they knew they were lying because this wasn't just happening to one branch; it was happening to more than four thousand branches across the country, and more than four thousand sub postmasters were wrongly accused of theft. And, you know, that's really bad, but surely you'd think the criminal investigation by the police would sort all this out when they were looking for evidence. Well, yeah. no, because the UK is a ridiculous country and it's got those weird, like, the Queen owns all the swans laws here and there. And one of those laws sure. is that the post office gets to carry out its own criminal investigations and prosecutions without ever what? involving the police. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so the, the most twee British possible thing would be a <laughs> ride-along show called Postal Cops, right? <laughs> <laughs> or a movie called uh, A Few Good Postmen. There you go. <laughs> weird yeah. So when the post office... You is- can't ship and handle the troops. <laughs> 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 so when the very expensive IT system the post office has spent a huge, you know, numbers of hundreds of millions of pounds on started to fuck up, the post office decided the best solution was to bully their employees into giving them what amounted to tens of millions of pounds of money that these people couldn't afford to give them. And when people ran out of their life savings and the IT system still kept imagining more money was going missing, the post office sent these people to prison. Like in all, Jesus. 900 sub-postmasters were convicted, 700 of whom were prosecuted by the post office directly. Like, seriously, between 1999 and 2015, the post office themselves falsely imprisoned an average of one person a week. Wow, and what's worse, you know, upwards of 10% of those convicts were accidentally delivered to the prison next door. Or, <laughs> <laughs> or just like a house next yeah, door. Hey, right, it yeah. says, or current resident, I live here now. <laughs> this is how it goes. And the thing is, some of those innocent people were in their 60s and 70s at the time they are in prison. Because like running a post office isn't a game you start in your 20s. You know, a lot of people semi-retired into running a post office as part of their shop. So some of them were in their 60s and 70s when they went to prison. Some were pregnant. Some were hospitalised with stress due to the ordeal. And more than one person took their own life as a result of this horrible, horrible mess. And all this because the stamps and envelopes place didn't want to have to admit that they spent money on computers that were broken. Wow. Yeah, we do that too, but with drug laws here. Right. Yeah, yeah, we sure do. Okay, maybe it's time to get rid of the, like, magical postal tribunal and their trials by drowning. Sure. And just use muggle cops for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. So... All of this has been reported on for literally years, decades even, and heroes like sub-postmaster Alan Bates has decided to, to stand up to the post office and fight it all the way to court and eventually won. But it really caught the, the, the public's attention with a hugely popular TV drama that was aired over Christmas starring the amazing Toby Jones. Prime Minister Rishi Sunet must have been watching TV during the festive break because he was suddenly very angry that he and his party definitely only just learned about this right this moment and definitely mm-hmm. at no other point before that because two weeks ago he promised a new law that would, quote, swiftly exonerate and compensate victims. Oh, swiftly? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's going back in time. Yeah. I thought I'm very glad that the party that's been in power ever since this cover-up was first exposed over a decade ago have decided they are going to finally now Act swiftly. Swiftly, right? Yeah, no, they were they were dragging their feet to build up momentum for such a swift moment. Yeah. Later. <laughs> and I'm sure news that the government gives a shit now that the public know about it comes as a great relief to the 59 sub-postmasters who've died since their false conviction and who will never get to see their exoneration. And also for however many more will die before the government's swift action ever materialises. Because... This is an election this year, basically, this election year. What do we really think of the chances that the Tories' swift action plan will be in place before they leave government? Right. Yeah. And if there's one thing I know about them is that they insufficiently plan for exits. So, right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Marsh, tell me if this makes sense. I feel like we could reverse Brexit overnight if UEFA would ban England from the European Championship. 100%. <laughs> right? Absolutely 100%. Yes. Definitely. You're back in. Yeah, You're back yeah. in all of a sudden. 
Still, all we need now is for Toby Jones to take a starring role in more stories about corporate and government scandals so he can finally get some justice in those areas too. You know, maybe he could star in the tale of the billions of pounds of PPE procurement money that fraudulently ended up in the pockets of Tory donors and lords during the mm. COVID uh, pandemic. Um, he could maybe play one of the expired face masks or the defective surgical gloves that the government wasted four billion pounds on before, and this is not a joke, before they boasted about how they burnt those things to generate power. Oh, I'm just spitballing. Here, there's no bad ideas. Oh, God. So, Jesus. somebody do the math for this on uh, this for me, somebody smarter than me, and find out how much less power they'd have gotten out of just burning the four billion in like 10 pound notes, right? Like, what <laughs> currency, <laughs> what denomination would it have taken? And finally, tonight, in we've reached a new low bobs news. Republican congressperson, violently aggressive nose booper, and public no look hand job expert Lauren Bovert. <laughs> attended her first GOP primary debate for Colorado District 4 last week. She's the sitting representative for District 3, but she was very likely to lose her bid for re-election there. Well, yeah, getting kicked out of seats is kind of her thing. <laughs> <laughs> right. So to avoid losing, she carpetbagged her way into the deep red wasteland of a new district where she recently signed a lease, so she's technically a resident there with a home. But... Shenanigans aside, she'll definitely feel much more at home in District 4, considering the field of Republican candidates is basically a police lineup after a gunfight in the parking lot of a gun-themed restaurant like the one she used to own before it failed completely. Of the nine people on the debate stage, six have arrest records, Jesus including Love Ups or <laughs> the first question from the debate moderator is, everybody say, hand me the keys, you fucking cocksucker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, yeah. The ones who don't get elected are absolutely going to form a gang and pull off a heist. No doubt to bounce. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and uh, big thanks to Brian for the link. Skepticratnews at gmail.com if you want to help us out. So here's what happened at the debate. Everyone lost. Everyone <laughs> lost badly, including the concept of American democracy as a whole. According to John Frank of Axios, it was, quote, a Republican primary that's devolving into a clown car crash. And, I mean, that does sound great if it literally happened. I kind of like that, right? Right. It also sounds more like an evolution than a devolution, to be fair. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. But the problem is, one of these people is going to win the primary and the general, for sure, because it's a deep red district. And again, two-thirds of the field has a criminal record. And I'm pretty confident we're not talking about, like, getting arrested at a protest event for Black Lives Matter right. or like smoking yeah. a joint. For example, one candidate is former leader of the Colorado House, Mike Lynch, who resigned his position last week, that's why I say former, when it came to light that he was arrested for DUI and illegal gun possession last summer. And during the arrest, which is on video, he told the state trooper, First, he said, you, you got to call the lobbyist for the state patrol. <laughs> when that went obviously very badly, he's like, please just don't tell anyone or I'll get in trouble. <laughs> just don't say anything. Not with Republican voters. You won't, Mike. You'll be fine. No. In yeah. fact, he did not get in trouble with like his voting base because of this. It's ridiculous. So we learned about the six criminal candidates when the moderator asked everyone to raise their hand if they'd ever been arrested. Six hands went up. And the crowd burst into applause at that point. What? Yeah. And that's when Bobert and two other candidates exchanged high fives to congratulate themselves on their arrests. Which is only the second most embarrassing thing she's done in public with that hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my favorite part of this was actually watching three of these candidates consider lying and not raising their hand when the question gets asked but then they notice like their campaign managers violently gesturing a raised hand because arrest records tend to be public information and it's a really <laughs> fucking dumb lie those three looked around for another second or two and then begrudgingly put their hands up <laughs> one, of, one of them reaches over and slaps the guy next to him that's a crime i did a crime was that <laughs> they'll probably do me for that right yeah, like I'm, I'm mostly interested in, in whether when the candidates who've never been arrested heard the crowd's applause, did they consider lying about also having been arrested? Because that's clearly what the voters were looking for in a representative. <laughs> right, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah, they really were. And just for the record, when I mentioned the crimes of Lauren Boebert, I was not talking about 
the drunk argument at a restaurant with her ex-husband, during which she booped him on the nose very aggressively, and he called the cops and reported her for domestic violence. She got clear to that. And I'm also not talking about vaping, verbally abusing the staff, and giving a heege to some guy during Beetlejuice the musical, as we've alluded to. She never got arrested for that. And I'm also not talking about the arrest that she did admit to, which she claims was the result of, quote, a simple traffic violation that was unpaid that she forgot about. She got that original violation for rolling her truck into a ditch, by the way. <laughs> like, I hope you realize she's exactly what the rest of the world thinks America is like. She's yeah. just like nailing every one of our assumptions, <laughs> like she's trying to check all the items off a stereotype bucket list or something. Yeah, she's <laughs> nailing it. No, uh, the crime I'm talking about, I'm actually talking about at least two other times she was arrested that I just recently learned about. And it all started, of course, at a country music festival. Check. <laughs> yep, another check, exactly. <laughs> Called Country Jam 2015. A group was being detained by police there, and as Lauren Boebert walked past that group, she yelled out, run! And what? it started a small <laughs> riot as these people tried to flee. That's when she got arrested for disorderly conduct and started yelling at the cops. Her yelling included... This is unconstitutional. No, it's not. It's definitely not that. And also, quote, she said, I have friends at Fox News, and this arrest will be national news. It did not become national news. In, in nine years from now on the Skeptocrat. <laughs> <laughs> I thought she tried to bring up that it's unconstitutional. Like, okay, yes, I was in a crowded theater, but I yelled, run, not fire. So <laughs> yeah, right. you must acquit, Your Honor. <laughs> So all that led to another arrest later that year. She was given a court date for starting a country music riot, but she missed that date because this is real. She forgot what day of the week it was. Seriously, hours after she was supposed to be in court, she wrote, I am now aware today is Friday. <laughs> Somehow that excuse was fine and she got a new date and she missed it again. This time... <laughs> She gave a handwritten note to the judge that said, I apologize for wasting the court's time. I want nothing more than to be finished with this case, as it's not something I keep on the forefront of my thinking. The judge responded by sending cops to arrest her. There you go. Uh, the thing is, if she was like local mayor rather than state representative, these are the kind of antics that would definitely have gotten her fame and her own like fun reality TV series, like America's right. Messiest <laughs> Mayor. It would have been a massively hit show. <laughs> she's just, she's aimed politically high, too high as all. Her real crime here is just over ambition and nothing more than that. <laughs> yeah. She's just trying to get all those checks for you. American. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. On that note, we're going to close it out for this one. Thanks to No Illusions. Thanks to Michael Marshall. And thanks to all the listeners who liked us and followed us on all the various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening and please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, you can send us gifts of money at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. Just like all the new generous donors, you will be complimented by name next time around. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes for your charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Scathing Atheist, God Awful Movies, D&D Minus, and Citation Needed, available in all the podcast places. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penis. Special thanks to Ryan Slotnick of Evil Giraffes on Mars. He is the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide or by Googling the only band called Evil Giraffes on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC, copyright 2024, all rights reserved.